episode 32 with Lang Whitaker. This is the Sports Business Classroom audio experience. If you recognize the voice, let me put a name with it. I'm Bo Estes, a host on NBA TV and an announcer on NBA.com. And I'm one of the instructors at SBC. Welcome to the show. Now, breaking into the world of sports can seem daunting, but if you're looking for a leg up, you've come to the right place. Each week, we talk to top-notch figures all across the industry to bring you lessons and advice to learn from. Thanks for spending some time with us today, and let the experience begin. Sports Business Classroom is an immersive sports business training and educational experience unlike any other. In addition to this podcast, SBC provides numerous opportunities for those looking to break into and grow in the world of professional sports. One opportunity that I'd specifically like to tell you about today is the CBA Mastery Course with none other than Larry Kuhn. Larry is undoubtedly, and I can't stress this enough, undoubtedly the leading expert on the collective bargaining agreement, and he has been teaching the materials to teams, agents, media, and students for over 20 years as an expert on the topic. Now, for the first time ever, he has an online course containing all of his material available for purchase to the general public. So, If you're looking to work in an NBA front office one day, this information is imperative to know. And by completing this course, you can not only learn the material, but you can become an expert in it as well. Larry Kuhn's CBA Mastery course is presented by SBC and is a surefire way to put yourself in a position to land a killer job in the business of basketball. Registration is now open, so visit sportsbusinessclassroom.com today to take a step toward the career of your dreams. The Sports Business Classroom audio experience is brought to you by Hall Pass Media and Hall Pass Studios. Hall Pass Media is a full-service marketing agency that specializes in brand consulting, event management, digital marketing, and creative design. Hall Pass has a wide range of clients and partners that include the NBA Summer League, the NBA Coaches Association, and the Basketball Tournament just to name a few. For more information, please visit hallpassnetwork.com. Lang Whitaker has been a friend of mine for over 20 years. Our stories share some remarkable parallels. Both of us played high school hoops in Atlanta. Both of us realized, no, we weren't good enough to pursue an NBA career. And then both of us chased a career covering the sport we still loved. But our stories really diverged when Lang hopped a plane to New York and became part of a basketball media revolution at Slam Magazine. The road from there to becoming the GM of Grizz Gaming has been something I've watched both up close and from afar, and it's the story we dive into today. I hope you enjoy it. First of all, um, thanks, Lang, so much for doing this. Uh, We've known each other, gosh, for a long time now, and it's funny because I was thinking about the first time that we met Years and now try to think if you can remember this. You were you were with Slam. Was it uh, playing golf? Yes, yes. At Little Mountain Golf Course, and you said this thing about me, and I was like, "That's perfectly put." And it was like uh, some occasional on-air talent at (laughs) Turner's back in the day, man. Back in the day. So Uh, yeah, it's been a while. Um, The thing that I think about you is you're even though you you were in New York for all those years, you're sort of famously an Atlanta guy uh, and an Atlanta backer. So tell me a bit about growing up here, the experiences you had uh, that made you so passionate and so committed to these local teams in this city. Um, I mean, I grew up when I was a kid, Dominique was on the Hawks. So like that was our superstar. And, you know, we would win 40 to 50 games every year and then lose to the Bulls in the finals. I mean, in the playoffs at some point or the Celtics or the Pistons or whoever. Um, so, you know, the Falcons stunk, the Braves stunk, but at least the, the, the Hawks were pretty good and, and it was somebody fun to root for. And then, um, as I got older, the Braves got better. The Falcons had a couple of runs here and there. Um, and then when I moved away from Atlanta, I always thought, you know, Hey, I'm moving to New York city. I'm going to adopt one of these teams, but I became more of a fan of the Atlanta teams. Really. Once I moved away, I, I think it was, it was interesting connection um, to home. 
I guess, you know, the, that's when the Hawks were terrible. That was like the early yeah. 2000s. Um, that was like the, you know, the, the Sheldon Williams years. Oh, um, wow. and, and the Hawks just weren't very good, but um, they had a lot of young players. Josh Smith was a rookie, um, you know, Josh Childress. I think that was the year they won 13 games. Um, and I would watch every single game because it maybe it tied me to home, you know. Um, yeah. And they, we had to delay doing this interview because I was watching the Braves game um, <laughs> and they went 13 innings or whatever it was. So uh, I don't know. I just always stuck to the Atlanta teams. And um, it, it's kind of maybe been like the one thing that I've lived in a couple of different places now, but that's the one thing I've always kind of had. And for those of you that are just listening along, right now Lang is wearing an Atlanta Braves hat and a How About Them Dog shirt. That's true. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the, the thing I don't think people realize, especially you and I both grew up here. I was more my high school years, but you probably more than that, is what Dominique meant to this yeah. city as far as Atlanta fans go. And, like, I don't know that maybe Trey's the next one, but that there has been one guy who has brought people down to that arena like Dominique. He was he was everything in the 80s. He was our Jordan. That's what, yeah. that's the way I say it is Dominique was our Jordan and you know we all thought and we all believed that he was going to be that good that he was going to take us to that level. Um and then like just a combination of things happened like the NBA left him off the 50 greatest players team. Yep. Um and that was like such a slap in the face to all the fans of the Hawks and everybody was like, are you serious and you know, I mean, maybe maybe we weren't as realistic as we should have been. <laughs> and I still think he belongs on that team. Who are um, you taking off? Please don't say it. Uh, Bill Walton. Okay, he's good. injured all the time. Um, okay, good. You know, there's a couple people that I think you could take off. James Worthy. Oh. Um, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think Dominique definitely belongs. Like, he's one of the 50 greatest players of all time. So um, I, I think people don't realize outside Atlanta what he meant to the city and to the region, really, you know, I mean, he played basketball at Georgia in, in college yep. um, um, and then ended up in Atlanta and basically played like the bulk of his career in Atlanta. So um, I, I, yeah, outside of Atlanta, people might not understand, but inside in Atlanta and now, you know, he's still there. Like that's the cool yeah. thing. He's, he's still announcing all the games and you see him at games and he's around and it's kind of cool to just have him still be a part of everything. I remember going to those games in the 80s, and first of all, it was wildly exciting to watch him play. I mean, the dunk highlights every single night, night yeah. after night, were unbelievable. But the energy, it, it, then it was the Omni, the energy yeah. in that place was different than I've seen it maybe since. I mean, they had the team that went to the Eastern Conference Finals. I don't know that there was a star on that team that you gravitated around in the same way. I think Trey Young's got a shot to connect with this city in a similar way. He's obviously just a different sort of player, but you know, I, I, the energy was something else growing up as a kid, especially because he was so spectacular. Yeah. I mean, the thing about Trey young, I think he connects with kids cause he, cause he's like small and he, you know, he's like a, a relatable yeah. as a basketball player. And Dominique was kind of superhuman, you know, Dominique yeah. jumped over people and dunked on people and almost every game did something like you couldn't believe that he actually pulled off. Uh, so I think, from that standpoint, like it's tough to match what Dominique brought and, and what he meant to everybody um, when I was a kid, at least growing up. So you grew up in Atlanta and, and Dominique's the, the big guy in town. Were yeah. you an athlete growing up and did you have dreams of, of making it big at any point? Yeah, I mean, if you put that word in quotes, for sure, I was an athlete. <laughs> Same. I, I played <laughs> basketball in high school and I, mean, I played baseball too and uh, did some other, you know, whatever I could play basically. But I, basketball was my my best sport my favorite sport i played two years of uh high school varsity and we went 45 and nine really zero thanks to me i was a bench player mostly <laughs> um but it was fun to do and you know i i kind of knew at that point like that basketball wasn't really going to be my future playing basketball um, my high school coach talked to me and he was like you know if you want to he goes you could play at a smaller college if that's something you want to do um, you know, let it, let me know. And we can start looking into that and seeing if we can find something where you could play like division two or NAIA yep. or something like that. Um, I mean, I kind of knew that there wasn't a huge demand for like slow five eleven point guards at the next <laughs> level. So I, I was already in high school. I like when I was in, um, high school, I was worked on the school yearbook. I worked for the school newspaper. I wrote a column in the newspaper about sports. Um, I kind of knew that was something I was good at and I, and something I could do. Um, and so I had already started kind of thinking about that. And then, um, uh, I decided, you know, at that point I was like, all right, it's time to give up the basketball thing. And, uh, <laughs> 
I, and, you know, I'm still around basketball and I've been in, around the NBA now for 20 something years without ever playing a game. Well, you, you've had this remarkable career that has connected you to the game at the highest level. Did you dream of that as a kid or as a high school player? Like, what was your dream when you're, when Lang's a, a senior in high school, yeah. what's the dream in life? I didn't know, honestly, like I, I didn't know, um, you know, and you see these, I had classmates and friends who were like, you know, since they were a freshman in high school, they're like, all right, I'm going to go to um, an Ivy league school and I'm going to become a lawyer. Or I'm going to do this and go to medical school and all that. Like, I didn't know. I, I just kind of, I knew some things I was good at and I was good at, you know, communicating and talking and uh, I could talk to people. I could get people to talk to me. Um, I was good at writing and writing something that is as much as you study it and work on it, it you can either, you kind of can either do it or you can't. Yep. Um, and so I, I knew those were things I was good at. And so uh, as I got further along in high school, I kind of realized, all right, this is something I, I maybe I could do. Um, and I started kind of drifting toward journalism and, and English and that side of things. And, uh, and I, I kind of sort of stumbled into it, honestly. You, I mentioned earlier, how about them dogs shirt that you got yeah. on? You, you stumbled to UGA. Yeah. Did you start to connect the dots there? What, what was the experience yeah. there like? Um, I, I started with journalism school and, um, started taking like all the introductory journalism classes. And honestly, I was just kind of, I, I thought it was kind of boring. Um, <laughs> I, you know, they I learned how to do the AP method and all this stuff and yep. the, the hierarchy of needs and all this other stuff. And I was like, okay, I, I got this. Um, and I was taking English classes at the same time. And I thought English was just a lot more interesting um, to me. And it was just, I don't know, something about it connected more with me. You know, they both kind of teach you how to write, teach you how to do stuff. And I, and I ended up kind of just going more toward the English side of things. Um, and, and always just figured, you know, if nothing else, if you study English, you can figure out a job to get, be a teacher or do something like that. But, um, you know, even by the time I moved back to Atlanta, I still wasn't hundred percent sure what I wanted to do, what I was going to do next. Um, you know, I lived with one of my high school basketball teammates, actually one of my best friends who I'd grown up with got, he and I had an apartment together at a place that doesn't exist anymore on uh, like Roswell and Habersham oh, okay. over that area yeah, yeah, across from the landmark diner. Um, <laughs> and, uh, that in the mattress store that we weren't sure if it was actually a mattress store. Like it, it was, was a open. front. Yeah, it could have been. It was open like all the time. We never actually saw people coming or going. People so, went in the back door, that sort I, of thing. I don't know. So we lived over near there and, um, you know, I was just kind of doing what I could and trying to figure out what to do and what to do next. Um, I'm going to, I'll just jump ahead. Cause I know the next question is probably something about this part of my life. So I'll just yeah. keep going. Um, you know, there's like the disco Kroger is right over there. Uh, the Kroger on, yeah. uh, it used the limelight nightclub used to be next to it when I was a little kid. So everybody always called it the disco Kroger. Um, but I would go there late at night and I was broke. Like I didn't have a job. I didn't really have anything going and I would read slam magazine and I, and these different magazines, oh, wow on the newsstands. I couldn't buy yep. them. I would just go in there and read them and then put them back. You know, nobody was in there at midnight. You could just walk around and wander around. So I was reading these things and I was like, you know, I, th I think I could write for these magazines. And um, about the same time, I, the internet was sort of coming around and I started writing um, record reviews and, and music stuff for a bunch of different websites that were just kind of starting out. One of them was Pitchfork, which now became yep. <laughs> this behemoth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I was I was just doing it for free for anybody who would let me do it because I just needed to get some like some reps and some clips and and have something I could use to show people that I could do this. So um, I was doing that for a couple different things, a couple different places. Um, I would go to the to the Kroger and read those magazines, and you know the magazines had those like cards that you the subscription cards yep. inside. So I would tear those out and like write down the people's names in the masthead and the contact information, and then go home and email them and say, "Hey, I, I you know maybe I want I can do something for you guys." And um, eventually, got to the point um, where I, I was working for Creative Loafing in Atlanta, the yep. weekly newspaper. Yep. Um, doing a lot of stuff for them. I started off doing music, got to the point where I was doing like basically like a kind of a city column, um, like the first column when you open the paper, um, which is a pretty good gig. Yeah. And, uh, I really was enjoying it. I met my, my girlfriend and uh, she was working for a magazine in Atlanta and we had a pretty good thing going. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm trying to think about this. There's, there's first certainly a lesson in there for students yeah. about your sort of ingenuity in finding the job and also, you don't, you know, my situation was different. I knew since I was seven years old what I wanted to do. Sure. You didn't know, but you no. sort of figured it out. So I, what would you say the lesson is there? 
Um, I would, you know, the one thing I, I would say is if you don't know, like, don't give up, don't, yeah. you know, don't pack it in. Cause, cause there are people like yourself who, when they're a kid, they say, like, all right, I know this is what I want to be. This is what I want to do. And, and you're able to kind of focus on doing that for, yeah. for 10 years before you turn 18 and you go off to college. Um, you know, I was, I was in college and I don't know what I'm going to do. I get out of college. I don't really know what yeah. I'm going to do. Um, and I just tried to kind of be open to as much as I could and, and try to, um, you know, the one, I, another thing that just kind of a, a recurring thing in my life is I, um, I kind of meet the right people and get in the right place and I'm able to kind of make relationships happen. Um, you know, I, I sent an e uh, a letter to creative loafing, just a, a cold letter to the music editor. And I was like, here's some stuff I've written. I live in Atlanta. I, I'd like to write for you guys. And, you know, six months later, one day she calls me and she's like, Hey, uh, we, we need somebody to, to cover, uh, were you uh, caught off guard or were you like, wow, this is, well, the funny thing was she was like, we need someone to cover like the, the urban music industry in Atlanta, which at the time, this was right when like outcast was coming yeah, out, yeah. you know, Jermaine Dupree, all that stuff was happening right then. Um, so it was like a kind of a amazing time to be around and cover all that, all that stuff. You know, I, I went to middle school with some of the guys from Goody Mob and Andre oh, from Outcast, And so I, I had a did little bit of. Did they remember you? Yeah. The dudes from Goody Mob, I knew better. Um, yeah. Andre, every time he sees me, he's like, he always says, I remember your face. Um, and, <laughs> but I wasn't friends with them then. But yeah. uh, so I was around all those guys and, and got to cover that, you know, in the mid, late nineties, I guess. Um and, and so it was kind of just, you know, serendipity. It was, it was sort of just luck that I, I was around as all that stuff was happening and creative loafing needed someone to cover that. And I just kind of stumbled into the right, right place, right time. Yeah. But I, I mean, right the lesson the was blown up. Yeah. The lesson I guess from that though, is like, I, I took advantage of it. Right. Like I managed to, to take that. And I, I got all these clips of, you know, I got to interview outcasts 10 times before they were, anyone knew who they were. And, um, was able to use that to, a couple of years ago. Billboard had me interview Andre for their cover story because because oh, wow. they knew I had a relationship with him and I had you know been around him long enough and I was able to get L.A. Reid on the phone and other people just from having that you know long long history there. Um, so to me that actually adds to your attractiveness to a magazine like Slam. Yeah, that you're sort of culture connected in that way too. Yeah. Um, but the thing that's different for you and me is you had the guts to move to New York. Yeah. Uh, tell me, tell me about that decision. Were you scared at all? Was there, you know, this is, this, you're moving to the big time at this point. Yeah. I think I was too young to, to, and too dumb to be scared, honestly. Like I didn't know, to be, I didn't know enough to be, you yeah. know, I mean, I was still a freelancer at creative loafing technically, you know, and, and, uh, my girlfriend at the time got a, you know, her goal had always been moved to New York. Um, mm -hmm. she wanted to move to New York and work in magazines and, um, so she got a job offer from uh, Teen People, which is People Magazine's younger, yeah. you know, version. Um, a really good job offer, you know, full time, all that stuff. At the time, I had written a couple of stories for Slam from Atlanta. I'd written a couple of smaller pieces, okay. And I had just done like two or three features for Slam. My first two or three bigger stories, they went really well. One of them was Sean Kemp, okay. Um, and I had flown flown to Cleveland, and he was incredible. He was just like completely honest and open about everything. And uh, they, they called it the Playboy interviewed and they laid it out like the Playboy magazine interview it was yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Um, but Sean was amazing. And I'd done a couple of kind of like bigger stories for slam. So um, I called the editor of slam um, Russ. Uh, and I was like, Hey man, my, my girlfriend uh, might be moving to New York. Uh, I might move with her, but I didn't know if you guys have anything open or whatever. And he was like, actually um, we have this online editor job that's open and we got to hire somebody for it. If you want to, if you want to do that, then you'd be great. I'd hire you right now. So I called her back and I was like, I got a job in New York. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so it worked out pretty yeah. well. It, again, it was kind of like right place, right time. Type Did it of happen thing. in a whirlwind? You're, you guys are gone in a month or two months and that's it? No, I mean, it took like a couple months for to finalize everything. Um, you know, she ended up moving and I ended up kind of coming and going for a couple weeks. Okay. Um, I mean, there was never like a day where I loaded everything in my car and drove or whatever, you know, like yeah. I, I made two or three trips when I had like bags full of stuff and got everything kind of up there eventually. Um, and, you know, that was kind of how I ended up in New York with a pretty good gig. And, uh, um, you know, at least I felt like I was moving to New York and I wasn't like just trying to find work or, you know, trying to break in or, or that kind of thing. I had a job. Um, with a place that a magazine I, I loved and was really yeah. excited to be a part of it. Um, you know, Slam, it's funny because like Slam is known all around the world and 
it was it was literally like five of us sitting at the end of a hallway in this room. Is that just, right? Yeah, I mean, there was no, there's hardly any staff at the time. Now it's like, I think they've actually staffed it out a lot more than it was. But at the time it was like, it was Russ, Ryan, Susan, me, Ben, Khalid. There, there was a very small group of us putting that magazine out every single month. Um, so I got to work with these people who became my friends and uh, it, it was pretty cool. It felt important too for somehow Slam Magazine because it was yeah. different a little bit. Uh, there was something extra about it. Uh, tell me about a few of your favorite stories that, that you covered w while working there. Oh man. Um, one of the early ones I remember I got there like around issue 45, 46 of slam. Now they're, I think I'm past 200, but, um, one of the first ones I got to do was, uh, Stefan Marbury. Yeah. Um, it was issue 48 and he was on the cover and we went out to Coney Island and he met us uh, with his Bentley at the projects where he grew up, wow. the mermaid projects. And um, we spent a whole day with him just running around Coney Island. And uh, I was writing the story um, cause I had watched him play at Georgia tech, you know, sure. he had just got yeah. traded. He had just gotten traded to the net. So it was kind of like his homecoming thing. Um, and so Russ let me write the story and uh I had loved seeing him play at Georgia tech. I saw his first game at tech and I was like, man, I've never seen somebody like was this that at the dome. Uh, yeah, it was, I was uh, at that game too. I think it was against marathon oil or somebody. It was one of those, like, yeah, you know, yeah. but I'd never seen a, a point guard with like the athleticism and the skill sure. and everything. Yeah. It was unbelievable. So we spent a whole day around Coney Island. My, the one thing I, I vividly remember from that was my, when we moved to New York, we were living in this apartment on 49th and second, it was a second floor walk up and we finally kind of found a place. I was a little nicer. It was on the upper West side and we were going to move that day. All our stuff was getting moved in a truck. And I couldn't go because I had to be at this photo shoot all day in Coney Island with Steph. So my wife was having to do the whole thing. And I asked Steph, I was like, you know, I rode with him in the car from location to location all day so I could oh, talk wow. to him. And I asked him, I was like, what do you think, uh, what should I get? I should probably buy like a present for my wife, right? Like, what should I get? Or girlfriend? Like, what do you think I should get? And he, and he was like, maybe, uh, maybe you could get her a, a really nice purse. <laughs> and I, was, I don't know why, but for some reason, I, that just vividly stuck with me. You know, um, what's, what's interesting is that you were really young then. Yeah. And you're covering young players then. We were and the same I, age as all those guys. That's what I'm saying. So yeah. There was a connection in that way, too, I remember. 100%. You, you can feel that? Yeah, 100%. And, then like, you know, that's when, like, throwback jerseys were really big. Like, we wore throwback jerseys, and so did the players. Like, we listened. Yeah, yeah. We listened to Outkast and the same music they were listening to at the time. And, you know, the magazine, we filled it with all the references to all that stuff because we were genuinely into it. We weren't, like, trying to mimic the culture or do anything sure. differently. Like, we were all kind of part of the same thing. And I think for the players, like, I mean, if you went to a Nets game or a Knicks game, you know, we were always in the locker rooms there. And you know all the beat writers are, are wearing ties and and yeah. pants and all that yeah, stuff, yeah. and then and then I come in in a Hank Aaron jersey and a pair of Jordans, <laughs> and and the guys are like, okay. And so I think that opened up a lot of doors for us uh, back then. Well, yeah, and I thought I think there's like that connection that you guys made that came through in the magazine uh, somehow. Um, yeah. Tell me about the links because the links were an <laughs> early thing that were it was a big deal, honestly, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, my job was, uh, my day job at Slam was running the website. And so I kind of realized pretty quick, all right, we have all this content from 40 something issues. It's seven, eight years worth of stuff. So I, and it wasn't on our website. So I start kind of uploading that stuff every day. Um, and then I realized like, you know, we need something new every day, something kind of fresh every single day. Um, a couple of people were doing like links type columns, you know, Simmons, Bill Simmons was doing yeah. one at the time. Yeah. Uh, there was a pointer, had a, like a, a journalism one that, uh, what was that guy's oh, name? Okay. Romanesco who did one every single day. Like there was a couple of types of things like that where people would curate news and, and put it together. Um, so I started doing one that was just basketball, NBA uh, mostly. And uh, I, I watched college basketball. I was never like that big onto it. I always liked the NBA more. So I, I kind of focused on the NBA and then, you know, every day I'd write a column um, at the beginning of it. I would write God. a couple hundred words about something, you know, some days yeah. it was about moving apartments. Some days it was about going to the game the night before wherever it was. Um, you know, some days it was, Oh man, did you see that Lakers game last night or whatever? I had to figure out something every day, but I would do that. Then I would link to news stories from around the NBA. This is before hoops hype. So nobody was really kind of aggregating. The key, the right? Yeah. It you was were doing that, that before them. Yeah. So that was the big thing. That was kind of what got people into it was this is a place you could come find every single thing. 
and it helped me really because like i i figured out a way to bookmark basically like one or two newspapers in every city around the nba and then i would just open them all up in tabs and kind of skim through them as fast as i could but it helped my inf- my like my own personal education about the NBA because I was reading every story about the NBA every single day. So I knew like every roster one through 12 in the NBA, uh, every player I knew, you know, and I would find little tidbits about, Oh, this guy, uh, you know, bought a new car or the rookies haze. This rookie got hazed by the veterans on this team. And um, I just, it gave me like a lot more knowledge about it than I would have if I was kind of casually, you know, just following along, I think. I think it, this is my personal opinion. I think it helped make a name for you too. Yeah, I for think sure. Other people in the industry congregated at that page to yep. figure out what was going on. Did you make a lot of connections off of yeah, that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, th- and this was before like um, comment sections, right? So there were no comments on the thing. Yeah, so thank I God. would I would post the thing and then start getting emails from people. So like the next day, if there was a couple of emails, I would put them in my column. But oh. I, I mean, I clearly remember one day I wrote something. I don't remember what it was. And I got an email from Ernie Johnson. Um, and oh. I was like, and I was like, Oh, I guess Ernie's reading. So yeah, yeah. You, know, you would get emails from people like that, that you didn't know were reading your thing. You know, um, I, I went to a Sonics game. I think it was, and I was in the locker room beforehand and um, Nick Collison's like, Oh, are you Lang Whitaker? Yeah. I read the links. Um, you know, there was a lot of random things like that where you're like, Oh, so people are really kind of following along, you know, um, to Sam's credit, like it was never really about page views or, or what are the numbers or whatever. It was just like, get content, do the best we can. Um, you know, it kind of felt, it kind of, fell along with the brand of slam it, you know it was the same tone and everything was the same thing and um it, it kind of took on a little life of its own and you know after a while i, I was like i gotta take a break because i was i was writing it's gotta be pieces. exhausting yeah. right yeah and, I, and I, at the same time i was writing you know a feature or two every issue of slam i was doing a column once a week for sports illustrated also yeah um and i wrote a book in the middle of all that too so there was like, you know, seven, eight year period. I mean, I was young and I was like, I, I can do this. I can carry this off. But I, I, eventually I got to the point where I was like, all right, something's got to give here. Cause, and also like, I didn't really have much of a life to write about, right? Like if you're writing about your life, you need a life to write about. And I, I didn't really have a life. I was writing, I was coming home and then my wife would go to sleep and I'd work on my book at night. So um, it, it was, it was tough. It was a lot of hard work. And you know, the, but that's another thing, like, I guess it's good for students to, to remember is like, it, it might look easy, but it never is. It's it's work, you know. Like there's no getting around. Like when, especially like when I have to write a story about something, you sit down, and you're like, all right, got to transcribe, you know. Like there's, it, that's like the worst part of writing anything. It's like doing the transcribing, but I still try and do it, you know. I still try and do the work. My wife's a producer at CNN. Um, did it help to have a relationship with somebody that was also in media? Yes and no. Yes, because um, you know my wife understood the world basically so like when things were happening like i mean as the links were kind of taken off a lot of things happened like you know the new yorker wrote a talk of the town about us and they did a cartoon of me in the new yorker um, and my wife like understood like what a big deal that was you know like, yeah it was like pretty amazing and then uh like when the book things were happening and i'm like these agents were talking to me and they wanted to sign me and then they're talking to the book companies and all that. So she had kind of understood all that stuff and how it works and all that. Um, at the same time, like she hates sports and um, never watches sports, knows nothing about sports. So like pretty much any story I would say, Hey, maybe you want to read this or whatever. Like she was only no. reading it. Yeah. She, she would read it to be polite or to <laughs> offer advice like on the construction of it or grammar or things like that. But you know, as far as sports go. No. Tell me about, I, I, I've seen you in a couple of these circumstances, but tell me about your interview style. Yeah. Uh, you know, what's your approach and, and, you know, how you try to get the best out of people. What I, I started doing this when I was at slam and I kind of figured out this works for me. So what I would do is, um, try and print out like every kind of long form thing I could find about the person from the previous couple of years. Um, I would print it all out, get it on, uh, paper go through and read it and make notes and say like oh that's you know somebody says uh, you know ever since i was a kid i i played nba 2k and then da, da, da. so i would think oh that'd be a good follow-up like what you know why did you start that or what team did you play with or whatever so i would always kind of make notes on the side things like that and i would put them all down on a sheet of paper like just all over the place and then i would get sit down and take all my notes and try to organize them almost in a conversational style so you know everything that's about growing up here everything that's about 
uh, basketball here, everything that's about off court here, whatever, trying to like put them in a way that might kind of flow together. Yep. Um, and then be willing to sit down with the person and, I have those notes there and I have things I've thought about. I might have like five or six questions. I definitely want to ask right there. Uh, but for the most part, I just kind of have all this stuff there. And if the conversation dies or gets stale or something, I can say like, okay. Um, yeah. So did you, you know, I can go to the questions, but for the most part, I, I don't want to have to like, just rely on, you know, every single question and making sure I ask this or that question. Where you go? Question number eight. Yeah. And you, you go that way. You yeah, know, you want a conversation. You, you know who I learned a ton from was, I mean, uh, watching on TV was David Letterman uh, because oh. I, I was a huge Letterman on NBC fan when I was a little kid. Sure. Um, and, and if you would watch Jay Leno, like he had his questions and he would ask you the question and then he would definitely go to question two and then definitely go to question three. And then Letterman would ask you a question and then ask four follow-ups about that question because of something you said. So, you know, he, he listened. And I think that's a key thing when you're interviewing someone is to actually listen. And it's hard, you know, it's easy to kind of get in your own head and think, oh, okay, I got to get to this, 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 and this. Um, but if you actually can, can, figure out a way to listen to what the person's saying and look for an in or look for a, a hole there. Um, I think that's pretty important. I, I think for him, like in, in the lesson is that when things went off the wheels or when yeah. things were sort of organic and going wherever they were, that's when he was in his element. And yeah. that's when he got his best stuff. If you ask me. Yeah. I mean, I always tell people, so like when you're going to do an interview, with some say an NBA player, NBA players are, are, or athletes are the hardest to me because you know, that person gets interviewed pretty much yeah. every day of their life. Right. So you've got 10 minutes to make that person tell you something that when they woke up, they probably thought I'm not going to tell somebody this today. Yeah. Right. So you've got to figure out some way to get them to tell you something that they weren't probably planning on talking about. If you want it to be interesting and, and different and newsworthy, um, sometimes they just say it, you know, a, a, a technique that I've found kind of works a lot is you ask somebody a question, they answer it, and then you just. And that silence is so awkward and it's it's brutal to sit there and, and they have like five seconds of silence when you're face to face with somebody. Sure. But the instinct of the other person is almost always to just talk to fill that to fill that silence, right? Because they're anxious and nervous, too. Um, so you ask a question, they, they might give you a short answer and then just, just let them just let it sit there for a minute and, and people follow up and they'll say things. Um, you mentioned the book. Yeah. Uh, tell me about a, where the seed comes from for this idea to the process and, and give, give, give folks an idea yeah. what it's like undertaking. I'm going to write a book. Um, so as the links were getting bigger and bigger, you know, people started kind of approaching me about doing bigger projects and, um, you know, I was writing about the NBA every day and I wanted to write about something else, something different, kind of get outside of, of that a little bit. Um, you know, the other kind of constant in my life had been the Braves, uh, growing up in Atlanta. Um, and you know, I realized it was getting near the end of the Bobby Cox era with the Braves. And I kind of realized I'd been there start to finish for it. Um, and it was pretty unprecedented. So uh, my my agent and I were talking about different ideas, and I and we kept coming back to the Braves as something that nobody had really written a Braves book about that era. Um, There's a lot to write about, lots to talk about. Um, and then we found uh, my editor ended up. Uh, it was uh, a guy who was a, grew up in the South, was a huge Braves fan. Okay, um, and so we find, kind of found the perfect person <clears throat> to work with on the whole thing. Um, so. Uh, basically you write a pitch. It goes out to all these book companies. Um, a bunch of them meet with me. Some of them say, we like the idea. Let's do it. Some say we like the idea, but not that much, but we have another idea we maybe you'd want to do. Um, uh, ended up a bunch of conversations after six months, a year, finally we found the right guy. Um, and then the, I spent about a year writing the book every night. <laughs> Did you say uh, no to some people too? That, that were um, I don't know if we said no. I mean, there was a couple people who were interested, but it just didn't feel like the right fit. And uh, there was another one company that really wanted me to, to do another book they wanted to do. It was an NBA kind of book um, okay. about like younger players coming up to the NBA. Uh, they had an idea for it. They thought it was going to be pretty big. Um, somebody en ended up actually writing that book. Um, and I think it did okay. I don't know. But okay. uh, so I ended up, just kind of, I, I knew I wanted to do a, write about the Braves. Um, 
and I found the right guy. I really liked working with him, the editor. Um, you know, Simon and Schuster is a pretty big company, sure. um, yeah. so it, it worked out pretty well, and it was fun to do. It was it was a good experience. It was just a lot of work. Like, we well, that's what I'm about. saying. You you talked about staying up late while your girlfriend and wife uh, is going to sleep, and you're up working on this book after working a full day. Yeah. Um, how? like start to finish or we're talking about a year year and a half here what are we talking about uh, about a year probably i mean it's um you know like a, an average cover story in slam magazine you, it, that stuff gets measured by words basically yeah. so a story in slam is probably like 2000 words long something like that maybe 1800 words and the book ended up being i think uh like 80,000 words something Ooh. like that maybe even 100 yeah um so the, the, the biggest thing with that ended up being, um, you know, a lot of times with those slam stories, like I, I wouldn't really have a, a blueprint in my mind. I would just kind of get the stuff I wanted in there and then figure out how it all fit together Okay. and then figure out the, but with the book, we, I, I had an outline, um, that I was able to work off of with my editor. Um, and so, we, I, you know, I knew each chapter was this, this, and this. So I was able to kind of, um, have a framework to go off of. And then we kind of figured out a schedule, um, my editor and I did where like I would write a chapter, get it to him. And then like, whatever it was, two, three weeks later, he would send it back to me with his edits and I would send him the next chapter and okay. we figured out sort of a way that worked so we could get it all done by the deadline. The, the other thing that was a killer was I had this great idea that in the middle of the book, there's going to be a break. And I was going to rank every player who played for Bobby Cox uh, by order of how much I liked them. Oh my God. And some of them explain it. Some of them. Yeah. Some of them I put a little explainer. So, you know, it ended up being like 500 players or something and I'm trying to rank them all and write these paragraphs. And um, the most impressive thing to me is in that whole big book there, I've only found one error, uh, like a statistical number that I got wrong or something like that. Um, But one of my friends pointed out, Hey, you got uh, so-and-so, hit 21 home runs instead of 28 or whatever it was. But uh, I can't believe we only messed up one thing in something that big and with, with that many numbers involved. Who was number one on the list? Just out of curiosity. Was it Chipper? Uh, I think it was Chipper. Uh, it was either Chipper Maddox or, or Andrew. They were the, my top three. Um, and I, I think it ended up being Chipper. And then I got to interview him for GQ a couple of years ago and oh, nice. spent some time with him. So it was kind of cool to actually like to sit down with him and, and, Ask him about Eric Gregg and some other things. I remember being at Metropolitan Pizza one night <laughs> back when I was young enough to go out. And, you know, it's like four in the morning and I'm playing pool with Andrew Jones. Nice. And I'm like, man, this is just nuts and crazy <laughs> and whatever. And I go home and, you know, it's it, you're getting home at five in the morning. I wake up the next day and it's like nearly one o'clock. I turn on the TV. The Braves are on. And out in center field is Andrew Jones. Of course. <laughs> it's like unreal, man. I bet he, he was good at pool, right? He, he, like was, he, he beat me. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was actually really good, but he was a super cool, super laid back guy. Uh, but it was, it was, it was crazy. So you finished this book. Was it a, yeah. was it like, whew, yeah. did you say, I never want to do that again. Oh, <laughs> oh I, wow. I, I, just, yeah. okay. I was like, I got that. That was, that was enough. So I, the book came out. Um, I had, I'd been at slam about 10 years at that point, And I was kind of starting to get burned out the, you know, things were changing at slam a little bit. And I, I had talked to them about figuring out a way to, to not have to write the links every single day. Um, we were actually starting to hire more people. So okay. there was, you know, a little less workload to go around. So, um, right about when all that happened. And then my, my wife got pregnant at the same time. I, there's also been a lot of talk about wives and girlfriends and stuff. I want to be clear. It's the same person throughout the story. I said your wife <laughs> and your girlfriend. Yeah. She started as my girlfriend. She became yeah. my wife and we're still yeah. married. But um, so, you know, my wife got pregnant and so it was all kind of coming together. And uh, I talked to the guys at Slam and they were like, you know, what would you think about being like a contributing editor? And, you know, you don't have to come into the office all the time. Still write a story every issue, but basically work from home and have time to do other stuff. And um, I was like, sounds great. So um, I spent a couple years as a uh, I can't remember what my title was, contributing editor or senior editor or something at Slam something like that. Yeah. For a couple of years. Um, and also wrote for some other people and I got to write for, uh, for GQ, the New York times, um, a bunch of other folks. And you uh, also created a man, uh, a magazine for soccer. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was, when oh, I was yeah. at, that, that was like when I was at slam, that was before the yeah. book. We started yeah. a soccer magazine. We thought this is it. Finally, soccer is going to take hold in America. I was this so excited. Is- 
We were too. We got four issues. And then you know what happened? Like Sakura hadn't taken hold in America. And uh, now, but the, there's no magazines now, I don't think. No, I don't know. I mean, it wasn't like it sold actually pretty well on newsstands. It was called Striker. Yep. Um, it, it a lot of stuff worked to our advantage, uh, being that like uh, there were no other magazines. So like, and the shoe companies were so desperate to get those guys known in the United States. Yeah. Um, that like you know I got to uh, Adidas flew me to Madrid and I got to spend an hour with David Beckham. Um, Jesus. <laughs> like there was a. Uh, was the, it nuts? Was he? Cool? Oh yeah, it was incredible. He was the best. He was so nice, nicest was guy. Was he ever. really? Like yeah. he he was focused on you and everything like that. He was. They were doing a commercial shoot in Madrid. Um, it was an Adidas commercial, and there was a bunch of other random dudes there, like Patrick Vieira and a bunch of oh, other yeah. Adidas guys. But um, they broke for lunch, and they took me, and it was me, him, his wife, all the kids. Oh, yeah. Um, eating lunch in this room together, um, and then I interviewed him, and uh, I have a picture somewhere around here, of me and him sitting there talking. Um, oh, wow. But he was just the nicest dude in the world. But uh, you know, there was a lot of that. Like we got to talked to Ronaldinho and a, who, the guys at the time who were like just you huge. went to Barcelona and talked to him right yeah I got to play oh, with them we, we, we played oh. at, at the new camp we went on the field it was like a Nike shoe launch and they had journalists in from all over the world and uh and they were like we'll fly you in first class do all this stuff and the guy Ben and I were together and I was like what if you fly us both coach but we both go and they were like okay because yeah. they had a bunch of other guys there too there was like seven or eight Nike athletes there so like sure. I interviewed uh, I did like a big press conference with Ronaldinho, but then they took us on the field and they gave us the cleats to wear and everything. And so they, you did like a give and go with Ronaldinho. Wow. And I, I passed it to him and he passed it behind me. And I turned around and was like, and, and he started cracking up. He thought it was funny. But, uh, I uh, I did a story on when, when he was with, I think it was AC Milan maybe. Yeah. Uh, and they came to Atlanta uh, for an exhibition game. And I walked on the field and you, you you don't you're not looking behind you when you're walking yeah. on the field. And it was in it was in the Georgia Dome before it became Mercedes. Yeah. And I walk on the field and I just hear this crazy screaming. And I turned around and three feet behind me was Ronaldinho. And he yeah. just looks at me and gives me one of these. And I was like, <laughs> coolest guy in the world. Absolutely amazing. Coolest guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like uh But it sold the magazine part. I was saying the magazine sold pretty well. It was just at the time, like other than the shoe companies, there weren't a lot of other corporations that were investing in soccer in the U S that were like willing to buy ads basically in the magazine. And you know, that's what you can sell all you want on the newsstand, but if you don't have enough ads in the magazine, it, it ain't going to make it. So somewhere along the line though, you learned the business side of things, right? Cause you were a writer, but where, where did that come from? It's because slam only had five people. Like, so, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, every single day I walked by our publisher's office, I probably sat down on his couch every single day. Um, you know, he also would talk to us about covers, like who makes, who should be on the cover? Why should this person be on the cover? Will it sell? Um, one of the like first, years of slam they had done an alan iris and georgetown cover and it was like one of the worst selling issues in slam history at the time um who knows why maybe you know maybe the yeah. weather was bad I, nobody knows but so so we could never do college players on the cover for a long time after that like when i was there the first seven eight years with no college players on the cover yeah. um but dennis dennis page he's still the publisher of slam uh, taught me just you know being able to sit and talk to him and listen to him um with, why do we you know when you shoot somebody for the cover uh, people don't really think about it like the cover of a magazine it's eight and a half by 11 and and you have like this much space to put a person's face or whatever it is but you got to have space for the cover lines on the side you got to have the name on top so you're really working with like a little rectangle to, yeah. to make something happen and what do you do to make it different and that was part of my job after i stopped doing the links for a while and i, I kind of i was the executive editor for a couple of years at slam and so i would kind of help come up with story ideas and all that stuff and come up with covers that were cool um and, you know, we came up with the idea for the LeBron as the NBA logo um, with like half red, half blue and him in the middle dribbling the ball. And uh, that was one of the more iconic slam covers I think we were able to do. I'm fascinated by the whole idea of the more you talk about it, the more working at slam must have been like working at a startup. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. It was, it was scrappy and it was, we had no budget to do things, you know, like it was just, it was like, do you look back upon it fondly now? Oh, very much so. Very much so. Um, it was fun. It was fun as hell, you know, and we got to go to NBA games a couple nights a week. You know, we um, <laughs> go grab a beer afterwards, um, me and the, the other guys from Slam. You know, we got to know all these NBA players and hang around all these uh, 
different shoe company things and got to go to different places and, you know, um, went everywhere from David Stern's office to interviewing Michael Jordan to, you know, I mean, I, wow. I don't know what else there was to do. It, at some point you get to like the point where you're like, all right, I've, I've done it. I like, I've done it all here. Like what, what's left, you know? It's a good point uh, because you keep challenging yourself in your career. That's what the pattern seems to be. You get to a very successful place and then you challenge yourself again. And so then tell me about GQ because this this opens up another avenue of what your life is about now. Because you you not only do you cover the basketball some, but you're also covering food, right? Yeah. Well, so for GQ, I, I was um, freelancing for people. I was doing some stuff for, the, for a slam and then writing some stuff for the New York Times, sports about just random things like the NFL red zone channel and reviewing video games and stuff um and one of my friends um from from the free darko group of guys yep. um bethlehem shoals yep. um, nathaniel friedman i had hired him to write for slam early on i had read their blog and thought wow this is really cool and different and like this is the kind of voice we need in slam something that doesn't exist elsewhere so he had written some stories for us for slam um and then he was writing for gq and then he um emailed me one day and he's like hey I can't do the, he was like GQ's NBA blogger basically. And he's like, I can't do the blog anymore. Cause he had gone to take a job somewhere else or something. And he goes, they need someone else. I was going to put you in touch with them if that's cool. So I uh, went and had drinks with, with the editor, um, Devin Gordon and, uh, and Devin was like, Hey, would you want to do it? Do you want to be our NBA blogger? And I was like, sure. So I spent two years doing that. Um, you know, basically writing a couple times a week about the NBA, yeah. um, Q and A's with guys, that kind of stuff. I mean, and if you thought slam open doors with the NBA players, like GQ, like, I mean, sure, like, sure. Yeah, like the, the, every guy wants to be a GQ. So that was pretty helpful. Um, but then I, um, uh, I got hired by our good friends at Turner sports yep. to, do, to write for NBA.com. And when that happened, uh, you know, my contract with Turner made it, exclusive to them to write about basketball. So I couldn't do the NBA blog anymore for GQ. By that point, Devin, my editor and I had become pretty good friends and, and he was like, well, what else would you want to do? Is there something else you could write about or contribute? And at you know, that time from when I left slam, I'd started kind of really getting into cooking. I'd always had, but even when really... you were like college, no, no, no. They, after okay. moving to New York, okay. um, again, right place, right time. I, one of the magazines, the company that owned Slam, they also did Double XL, the hip hop magazine, and they did this magazine King. And I had seen on Food Network one night this story about like the the this uh, young chef in New York this is the first uh, chef like under the age of something to get a five star review, and um, he was born in Ethiopia and raised in Sweden. So I did a little back of the book story on this guy, Marcus Samuelson. Yep. And I showed up wearing a soccer jersey just because that was what I wore that day. I didn't know he was into soccer or anything. Oh, okay. I showed up at his restaurant, and he's like, oh, my gosh. So we talked soccer, and he's a huge basketball fan. We became friends. So as I'm getting into cooking, and I'm friends with this dude, I could text him and be like, hey, if you cook a chicken, you know, am I supposed to baste it? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> You're texting a famous 100%. Chef. Just yeah. nonsense cooking question. Well, now he's famous. Now he's like on Chopped. Oh, so he was, he was yeah. just a normal guy. Back At then. the time, nobody really knew. I mean, outside of New York and fine dining, like people didn't know who he was. But um, so I, I just watched a lot of Food Network and wa read a lot of stuff on the internet about how to cook. And uh, I would cook dinner every night for me and my wife. And it was sort of a creative outlet, just something that was different than basketball, something to do. Um, and I had gotten to the point with, I was pretty good at it. Like we had people come over to eat all the time yep. and they all said it was good. And I was like, I told my wife, I was like, you realize like, they're going to, they have to say it's good. They came over to eat. Like it's sure. like, they, they have to be polite. He's like, honest with you. I know that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, I, so anyway, I, I told my editor, GK, I was like, what if we did a column about like cooking for guys uh, who don't cook? Yeah. Um, you know, maybe it's recipes. And then it became, um, after Devin, uh, I started working with another editor who's still there, Chris Gamali and Chris and I talked about it and it kind of, I started doing Q and A's with chefs about cooking at home. Like how, do, what's your, uh, you know, Emerald, how do you, what are your tips for cooking at home? Or, uh, Jose Andres, these like big time famous chefs yeah. that I was able to go to lunch with, hang out with, go cook yeah. with. Um, and so that, you know, it, it was something again that kind of just was there. And I was like, um, don't you think this has blown up sort of as you've been involved in it? too yeah like for sure timing again is really good yeah for sure for sure and the, the my dream one i always wanted the guy who i always liked the most was the chef jacques pepin um 
you know, he was like in the seventies, he and Julia child had a show on PBS oh, okay. um, in the fifties. He was like one of the first French chefs to come to New York and open like a fine dining French restaurant. And then he had all these shows on PBS. And to me, he was the best one of all those chefs. Um, wow. you know? And so I always just wanted to, to interview him and he was sort of my white whale. And I, I could never find like the right entry or the right PR person or whatever. And every about every like two months I would think about it and start Googling and trying to find something. And then finally, like four or five years ago, one day I I found the right person. And uh, this woman, I was like, she was like, yeah, he'd love to do an interview with you. Pick a restaurant. You guys can go eat dinner together um, and and you can interview him. So I I, she said he loves ethnic food. I had just done his piece on this uh, chef who had a Vietnamese restaurant, French Vietnamese. He's French. So I emailed that chef. He set it up. So I had dinner with Jacques Pepin there and he was 80 two or three at the time we had two bottles of wine wow. um, and had like a two hour dinner. And then I helped him get back to his hotel um, afterwards in a taxi. Nice, good nights of you. That was the night I came home and I, I told my wife, I was like, all right, I, th- I think I'm done. Like I, I really? honestly like that's I've like, climbed the mountain. Yeah. Like that's the top. Like, I got, I don't know who else can I interview like or talk to about this stuff. Um, like that's the guy I've always wanted to get. And I got mm-hmm. him and it was amazing. It's like one of the best interviews I've ever done. He was so good. Um, and and I kind of was like, all right, now what? Do you, so you get to, you know, you've interviewed every NBA player that you want to interview and everything. Did you get nervous climbing to the top with these guys because this was a different realm and maybe you didn't have as much experience? Or were you like, I feel like I know how to interview now? Like the, the experience yeah. of the NBA maybe helped you out there. Uh, I think the experience helped and, and knowing how to interview helped. But also, like it sort of worked because the whole rubric of the column was like teaching people who don't know about food, food. So, um, you know, I was able to kind of if I if I didn't know something, I I could kind of couch it as that. Oh you know, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Like so, but for the most part, like I, I felt like I kind of knew what I was talking about. Um, there was this one chef, Alex Atala. He's he has like the number three restaurant in the world, and wow. he's on that Netflix show. Um, the, the chef's table or whatever yep. he's, he's in Brazil. He's a Brazilian chef. He was in New York and, uh, and we were going to go to the green market and go shopping. And on the way there, we passed Italy, Mario Batali's place. Uh-huh. And, and he was like, Hey, why don't we just go in here and I'll cook something. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so he kind of <laughs> talked his way into like one of their test kitchen things. And we went in and bought all this food, but he made this, uh, this pasta dish. And he's like, this is really simple. It's easy. And it had anchovies in it. And at the end of it, I remember thinking like, I was like, you know, hey, uh, you know, you could maybe put some Parmesan cheese on there. And he, he like shot me this look like you never <laughs> you never put cheese on a fish dish. And I was like, I, I had heard that before on television shows. Yeah. And I was like, oh, right. Of course. Yeah. Exactly. Act real professional. You know what I'm thinking? You sort of do have a Letterman thing about you where you're willing to go along with these things. Yeah. Where he says, let's just do, let's change the course. Let's completely go against what's planned and see what happens. Your willingness and your comfort to do that maybe bring some stories to life. Well, that's, I think if you're doing an interview, like, I mean, that's the best thing you can get a spontaneity and something different. Right. Cause again, with these athletes, like everything is the same every single day and they're really good about not, giving you much uh you know understandably like they don't want to give out their whole life every single day to people um so when you're doing something and something different or you know comes up go for it i I remember i did a andrew bynum story for slam i was in la and uh, i assumed i was going to go to the lakers practice facility sit down with him in the stands after practice interview him Mm -hmm. and then that'd be the story um and he was like in his second or third year. He was kind of a young guy on the okay, way up. Yeah. And uh, I practice is over. He comes over. And he's like, hey, do you mind if we go get something to eat? And I'm like, sure. So I go get in his Mercedes with him. And we drive around El Segundo. And we go to a Quiznos or something. And we buy this. And in, in his car was all this like crumpled up fast food wrappers on the floor. <laughs> and I was like, okay. He's well, a kid. Yeah. So, but it gave the stories like something completely different and a different, you know, angle than I would have had otherwise. And then the funny, the kicker to it was like two months later in the LA Times, there was a little note like the Lakers have hired a nutritionist to work with Andrew Bynum. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't they a direct read the article. Apparently. I'm sure they read the article. Like, yeah, there was no direct connection, but I was pretty sure that they had to be connected. <laughs> you know what's funny is, I, and I hadn't thought of this before talking to you, but do you find interviewing somebody over a meal is a different experience? You even talked about interviewing Beckham yeah. that way. Is it a diff? Does it open up people in a different way? 
It can. Um, you know, it gives you something else to kind of distract from, and you can be like, oh, okay, well, uh, you know, if there's a if there's a quiet moment, you can take a bite of something. Yeah. Uh, you know, but I, I don't know. I don't think it's that much different. Um, you know, it, the place is the place. If anything, over a meal, maybe the person has a beer or a glass of wine or something, and they'd be a little more sure. open Loosened to talking about it. Yeah, for sure. Um, then you come and join us at, at the network. Uh, what did it feel like, uh, you know, working at Turner Sports, the, the, the whole network experience, that, that feeling? I had actually, so when I was at Slam, this is all kind of jumping back and forth, but one, at one point when I was at Slam, um, NBA TV reached out and they were like, hey, we're doing this show called uh, The Jump. I think it was The Jump at the time. Yeah. No, The Beat. We're doing is that a show Jared's called... thing? The, no, no. It was Jared things? It was the beat, and it was me. There was, it was, I think it was the first year it was Mark Fine, okay, yeah. and then and then it was Vince the next year, Vince Cellini. Yeah, but they were like, We want, um, it'll be like you know, news around the league, we'll interview GMs, coaches, that type of thing. And the, the show was basically me and David Aldridge for a half hour every week. Yep. Um, I had never taken television training, I had never done anything like that. Um, I had done some little things, like I was yeah. on v- VH1's, um the new millennium, whatever it was. I love the new millennium. That's I was fun. Like, yeah. I'd done little things here and there, but never like really worked at it or, or, or learned sort of the craft of how you do television. And that was kind of where I learned it was on the fly, just watching David Aldridge, um, you know, like on the TV screen, uh, the first one we did, um, I didn't know that like when you're on camera, you're supposed to go like this. <laughs> <laughs> like when you're not talking. Yeah. So the so the first show we do, I'm sitting there and I'm just looking ticked off. Well, then yeah, I watched the show back and I was like, God, I look like a hostage. Like we, I gotta <laughs> we gotta figure out a way to to make that better. And then I noticed like if you look over next to me in this the box next to me, David Aldridge is sitting there smiling. So I was like, oh, that's how you do it. Um, yeah. You know, I learned if you can talk in 30 second segments without going, um, you know, um, if you can just talk straight for 25, 30 seconds that's all a producer is really looking for. And yep. then if you can add some information or be funny, those are the two things. And I've always been able to kind of make people laugh. So that, that was sort of my angle on that stuff and figuring out a way to kind of bring slam sensibilities to it. But I got to do that for a couple of years. Uh, from there, they had me shift over and do the show, the jump for a couple of years with 3d and uh, Brent Barry and Jared. Yep. Um, did that for a season or two um, and then got brought on to, to write for NBA.com and, and do the all ball blog, which uh, in some ways, you know, I, I was doing a blog before there was a blog when I did the links. I didn't, they weren't called blogs, but that's basically yeah. what it was. So the all ball blog was sort of the same type of stories, same kind of thing. Uh, my favorite part of that gig was uh, during playoff time. Um, I would basically just be on the road for a month or two months covering games and, uh, you know, I'd be, I, I still lived in New York, but I would cover games in the region basically. Uh, and then sometimes I'd be sitting on the couch and I'd get an email like, Hey, we need you to go to Oklahoma city tomorrow. Um, and so I would fly to Oklahoma city and cover the games there and cover all sorts of different series. So I really get to go all over the place and cover these playoff games, uh, which was really cool. Yeah. It's quite an experience. I, I remember flying back from San Antonio for Turner one time. I was supposed to be home for a few days. I landed, get a voicemail. We've got you on a six o'clock flight yeah. tonight to Minnesota. And you're just like, yeah. whatever that, but that's the life, honestly. Yeah. That, that and is it's a, the life. That's a totally different experience. Also just work-wise, I had to write game stories, you know, or, or stories about these games. So, you know, the game ends and you've got, you're in a race basically to, to write the best story that you can. Um, about the game that happened, what happened, why did it happen, all that stuff. And you got to get it in as soon as you can because it's got to live forever to tell the story of that game. Yeah. But you also, you're constricted because you got a flight at six o'clock the next morning and you got to get back to your hotel and maybe Uber is not going to be working in two hours and all that stuff. So, um, you know, one thing I took from that was and my wife was asking me, like, when we moved one time, she was like, you know, where do you need a desk here or there? And I was like, you know what? Like, I would love to have a desk somewhere, but to be honest, like I can write anywhere because I've written in the basements of arenas all over the place. I've written on airplanes and buses and everything else you can think of trains. Um, you know, I had to do the wizards Celtics series one year and I was just going back and forth by train, uh, oh, yeah. the East coast. So like I've written pretty much anywhere you can write and all I basically need is a set of headphones and a laptop and I, I can file you a story on time. Um, so yeah, I think one, my takeaway from that is that you, you learn a lot of versatility and, and kind of adaptability, uh, being in that situation. And now we get up to something I'm truly 
fascinated by. Uh, um, I a few years ago, my nephew, who was seven years old at the time, started telling me that my voice was on an NBA 2K video game, yeah. and I was like, "What?" And I did. This is something that doesn't exist in my world. I do my job and everything like that. I know. I know that there's video games, but you go and join Grizz Gaming. You're working with the Memphis Grizzlies. Tell me. Yeah about that aspect tell me about your full job first of all and then let's talk about the the grizz gaming okay so wait i, I missed what you said tell me about the the job first the of all full job the, your whole responsibilities yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so uh i've been at nba tv.com for like three four years um my wife and i were thinking about moving back to atlanta we kind of kicked around this idea um, our son was, I think, four years old at the time. We were just kind of burned out on New York. We'd been there 15 years, something by that point. Yeah. Um, and so we were kicking around things and I'd kind of started talking to other people in New York about, uh, like places I could go write other stuff for a year or two, that kind of thing. My contract was up with NBA, um, digital. So, you know, my wife was like, you know what you should do is like, just put it out there. Just say you're a free agent, just tweet it and yeah. see what happens. And, you know, like from a pride standpoint, like sometimes you don't want to do that. And I, I sure. kind of found two other places that I, I thought were pretty, pretty good chances. One of them was going to happen um, in New York City. And I was like, you know, like, let's just stay another year or two. I'll, I'll go work at this place, that place. And, uh, and, you know, we'll figure out a way to figure out an exit strategy strategy at some point. But then she was like, you know, you have a lot of followers on Twitter. Like you should put it out there and see what happens. So I tweeted. Um, my contract's up. I'm a free agent. If anybody's interested, holler. And about 20 minutes later, I got an email from Mike Wallace and it said, hollering was the subject <laughs> line. Uh, and I knew Mike, he had been at ESPN and he had come to the Grizzlies to work for Grind City Media in Memphis, um, which they were starting up. And he was like, hey man, let, let's talk. Um, the, like a day later, I was on the phone with the president of the Grizzlies and they were like, come down, spend some time. I had been to Memphis a couple times during the playoffs, covering sure. games for NBA.com and spent some time like around the arena downtown. I knew it was like a city kind of on the, on the come up and it was a really cool city, like right on the water. It had a cool vibe to it. Um, so I had a lot of stuff going for it. And, you know, my wife was burned out. She was working in media the same way. It yep. been been at a lot of high profile magazines and jobs she was working a lot um getting home late you know missing time with our, our son and so it all kind of clicked and worked perfectly and so when i was met with the grizzlies you know i assumed it was mostly going to be grind city media and um i had written a review for for gq like the day i came here i'd written a review for uh gq of the new nba 2k game i can't remember yep. which one it was and it had come out on gq.com that day and so I come in and I meet, start meeting with people um, with the Grizzlies, and they're like, "Oh, by the way, we also have this uh, 2K League team. We're going to be starting next year. Um, would you want to run that? You want to be the general manager of Grizz Gaming, just as an extra, right? <laughs> like nobody really knew what to do with yeah. it, you know. And so I was like, "Yeah, like to me, that's more interesting than the other part because it's something you've never done before. It's nobody's done it. It doesn't yeah. exist. Like this league doesn't exist. Nothing is. I, I, there was a big empty floor in the building in the admin building. They were like, we're going to turn this in to the Grizz Gaming space. Um, you know, and it was something that I could mold and totally make into whatever I wanted. You know, wanted it to yeah. be. And the organization was 100 percent behind it. They they you know, we're like, let's, let's have fun with this and, and make it different and unique. One of the things they told me lots of times is like, you know, uh, if we're going to do something that like, let's do it unique and do it differently. Like why do the same thing everyone else does, which was, you know, something that okay. kind of throughout my career, um, had, had a different kind of voice, a different voice yeah. has always been important to you, right? Yeah. Just doing something different. I got, you know, I got that from Howard Stern, like Howard, I always listen to his interviews with celebrities of the same kind of way we talked about trying to get people to tell you something. Yeah. You know, people say stuff on his show all the time that crazy comes headlines, right? Like every yeah. single day he'll have George Clooney on there. Who's been interviewed a million times and somehow Clooney will say something on that show. Yes. Uh, and, and because Howard figures out a way to get these people to talk. And, and he also talks about like, if nothing else, it's got to be entertaining. It's got to be different and entertaining. And, you know, people are giving you their time. So make it interesting and make it entertaining. So, um, you know, that's kind of something that here in Memphis, they were interested in too. And they were like, let's do something new and different. And uh, they were starting up Grind City Media, like their own in-house uh, digital media company. Uh, Mike Wallace was here. Alexis Morgan was here. Um, and they were kind of starting to staff that up. And so Chris Vernon was here. Yeah. Um, 
doing a daily show. So they brought me in to be a part of all that. That was three years ago, right about this time of year. So I'm trying to figure out, like, you're the general manager. Yeah. Like, do you feel like you're the general manager of a team? Like, do, do, yes. the, look, I'm looking and I'm I'm scouting other people and I'm 100%. seeing who's coming up. How does that work? Like, how, do do you talk to the actual general manager of the Grizzlies and say, "Hey, I'm going through this"? Do you ba- like? <laughs> do you? I, I don't know how. Like, I, I don't since it's never happened before. Yeah, no, I wouldn't know how to go about it. Uh, I, I do talk to the general manager of the Grizzlies, not <laughs> usually about that, but I do talk to him pretty regularly. Zach's awesome. And he's done incredible Sure, with their actual Grizzlies. But, um, you know, honestly, like when the thing started the, you know, I, I drafted six kids and they moved to Memphis. How do you make um, these picks? Like, what are you, lo- what are you looking at? Um, the first year, well, the thing is, since it's a digital process, right, it's a video game. So to, to get into the league, there's a tryout in the video game. Yep. And you have to win X amount of games with a certain winning percentage and all that. But uh, we get stats. We get reams of data because it tracks all that stuff. So yeah. you can see shooting percentage. You can see turnovers. You can see down to like uh, who dribbles the ball more than this person and that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, going into season one, it was really sort of using all that data to try to put together a team. And then I think as this we're in, we just finished season three. Um, and, you know, a lot of these guys play together in the off season. They play together just okay. in this pro-am sort of circuit. They all know each other, know of each other. Um, so it, it really has become more about trying to find, like, the pieces that fit together um, pretty yeah. well as it's gone along. As you're going along, it, this is how I would think of it. So, yeah. so feel free to not feel this way. Do you ever sit there and think to yourself, I'm pretty good at this. Maybe I could run an actual NBA team. I mean, like, <laughs> does it ever cross your mind at all? Well, we haven't made the playoffs yet, so I can't. Oh, that way. <laughs> no jobs um, have come your way yet. No, but I mean, we have finished in the top. Uh, I think we finished twelfth this year, but we've been over five hundred every year. Like we we finished like one spot out of the playoffs every single season. Oh, do you stress uh, like during games and stuff? Like oh that? yeah, hundred percent. Because you know, like it's fun and all that, but like for these guys, like this is their, their livelihood. Career? Yeah, this yeah. is their job, and you know, um, you know, I've talked to the guys about it. Like some of them, like th- they don't have a fallback. This is it, and so. Wow. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to do the best we can uh, to do right by them and and uh, do right by this organization and all that stuff, too. Um, so, you know, it's stressful um, for me. And, you know, when you lose, it sucks. Like, you go home and it's it's a most... You, like, look at what could we have done differently? 100%. Like, we watch film together. Like, I'm also the basically the coach. So, you know, I, I, like, we I'm during the games, I'm on the headset, like, in helping them figure out what plays we can run. When do we call a timeout? Should we foul? Should we not foul? All that stuff. Um, and you know, when the game's over, like, I mean, there's nights where you can't sleep, you're pissed off. Like it's like, it's a closest experience. Though. to I me. It. It's like being in high school playing basketball. Yeah. Again. You know, like it's the closest to me to having that experience and being like an athlete. Um, this is the, the closest thing I've found to that, to that, you know, um, urge you get from that the energy you get yeah. like, and when you win it's amazing like it feels so good when you win you know like it's you won so a great. game you yeah. have the same feeling when in high school when you win a game yeah. uh not that we had that feeling that often at medical <laughs> but in any case uh, but like uh I, I i sort of wonder and we talked about it, we were talking on the phone earlier today like the experience you're having now is one i'm envious of Tell me about what it's like to work as a team and be a part of an organization and to feel fully invested in that. Yeah. I mean, I I think people, fans don't understand really like how invested people who work for the teams are, Um, you know, as part of my grind city media duties, uh, we we do a pregame show on social media um, on the court before every home game. And then after every home game, we do a wrap up video. Um, and then, you know, go to the locker room, talk to the players, all that stuff. There's been plenty of times where, like, I've left the arena um, at midnight, and then I'm back here at 8.30 the next morning, and the parking lot's half full. Like, people are already here working and grinding. Wow. Um, you know, I think a lot of us who work for the franchise, work for a team, um, you know, we're all sports fans at some level, and that's why we got into this field, and that's why we're doing this. Um, and this is as close as we're going to get to being an NBA player or to being a pro athlete um, is working around them and, and doing what we can to, to kind of help push this thing forward. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier today, like I, I told you, like, you know, the first year I was here was the last year of um, it was sort of winding down the grit and grind. Team. Yep. And then last year they end up trading Mark and, and Mike. 
Um, and then all of a sudden we get Ja and, and Jared. Imagine that. Yeah. And all of a sudden, like, you know, instead of being a couple of years where you're rebuilding, like there's a pretty clear thing of this is where the way we're going that like Taylor Jenkins comes in. Um, you know, it, it's been a pretty quick turnaround from, from the way most teams have to rebuild. Um, and it's been amazing, man. Jaws unbelievable. <laughs> like I get to watch him every night and it's so much fun. And you're going to want, get to watch this career growth. The thing yeah. I'm wondering, you know, not every number two pick in the draft turns out to be fantastic. Was there yeah. a moment you've been around the league a long time. Was there a moment where you went, oh, okay, we got something here, but this, this is going to work. Yeah, yeah, immediately. Like we saw like the first, they had a, a <laughs> exhibition games, um, you know, and actually like the first week of the season, he, he was okay. Didn't like show out, but then there was a, you know, the, he had the game where he had a game winner against the Hornets. Um, he dunked on Aaron Baines, um, which you probably <laughs> call it a highlight of. I'm sure um, I did. Um, he dunked on Aaron Baines in Phoenix. There was a bunch of stuff that happened like that first month of the season where all together you're just like all right this this is this is really happening and then you know the cool part of it the whole thing one of the coolest parts was uh let me see if i can get the picture right behind me that's that's me and Ja, and my son because i got to write the Ja cover story for Sam oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. this year so they called and they were like we're doing i yeah, i'm still friends with the kid who's the editor now i call him the kid he's not a kid anymore but he was when he when he used to be like our intern at slam but adam who's the editor of slam and i had been talking and i was like hey when it comes time to, to put john ja the cover again let me know i'd love to write it um and so it it came that, that that time came like a couple months ago. So I got to, to write a jock cover story for slam, which was cool. Cause I hadn't written anything for them in a long time. Speaking of the kid, does your kid, is he starting to enjoy it? Does he get it? Yeah. Okay, I mean, I try to like, I try to remind him and, and try to keep it as like, I don't want it to get like wrote to him. I want it to be special. And I want him to understand yeah. like that, you know, most kids in his school and his friends don't get to do this. Um, you know, and, and cause I, I, but at the same time, I like, didn't get to do that. I didn't either, you know, and yeah. I, I was a huge fan and I, and I, you know, I, it's not lost on me that like, I have a key to this building and I have a key to the yeah. arena and I can bring him in there 24 yeah. seven. Um, and sometimes after school, I, I'll bring him in there and we'll shoot yeah. around and play around. And then I, but I try to like, uh, keep it special. There was a time like right when I started here, um, like the first or second week we were here, we walked in. This, there's like a back entrance, and we were walking in for a game night. It's a couple hours before the game, and I, he was with me. And uh, up ahead was Mark Gasol, and I and I said, uh, I said, "Hey, look, there's there's Mr. Mark." And uh, I said, "Say uh, say hola." And my son, my wife's Cuban, so my son speaks yeah. a little Spanish. So uh, my son goes, hola. And Mark goes, oh, hola, como estas? And he turns <laughs> around and has like this conversation with him in Spanish. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, so I was like. I, I Are couldn't... you catching on or is your son better than you? Yeah, so hablo un poquito. I speak a little okay. bit. But I, I got enough to like to catch on. And, and you know, I was like, that's a thing he's going to remember the rest of his life. My you know? gosh. And so, you too. Yeah, for sure. Did you see the news on Mark today? I did. I haven't seen it confirmed. No, but neither have I. Not, but... Yeah, but Mark's the best, man. He's an unbelievable guy. Yeah, um, thr thrilled for him if, if that's what he wants to do. Yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. Um, so how did COVID impact your league? So we had uh, had our draft in February, March, uh, into February. Um, the six players had flown to Memphis. We had all set up, and, and in previous seasons, all our games were played in a television studio in New York. So we would fly back and forth every week. Um, you know, like 15 times a year, uh, a summer to play all our games, um, which were all broadcast on Twitch and YouTube. Um, and, and so the COVID stuff happened right around March, something like that. Yep, and yep. everything got locked down. So the guys were all here. And so we basically sheltered in place as a team. Um, they were their own kind of family unit. Those guys were together in their apartments. I was with my family. Uh, we would practice every day online and I had the same headset on and I could watch their screens from yep. my laptop. So from my house, we would practice and I'd talk to them. You know, I talked to them every single day and saw them, but not You say practice and it's just unbelievable to me because it's so yeah. such mimics what NBA teams do. Yeah, we practice like six days a week, seven days a week, a um, couple series a day against other teams. Um, but, you know... At some point, you know, when nothing else in the world was happening, like everything shut down right at the beginning, whenever that was, March, April. Yeah. Um, and I think the 2K League realized, like, you know, we can actually keep going. We can have games. Um, it's not going to be ideal. We're playing from commercial internet, from apartments on, you know, it, maybe it's not going to be perfect, but 
but there's this there's kind a of need vacuum. for programming. There's yeah. like a content vacuum, and we can provide something. So, um, almost all of our games ended up being on ESPN this year uh, on the app and it's on huge. ESPN two, ESPN. Um, it was it was really weird when it started because it was so funny. You know, like this whole league didn't exist two years ago, and now it it's this you know yeah. um, so it, it was cool to see it happen the way it did and uh you know it was stressful like the guys for all of us like you know the guys weren't able to go home really and, and see their yeah. families and their families are dealing with their own situations at home and covid there and dealing with all that and so you know we really kind of had to lean into each other as a, as a group um and, you almost you know, grow from it, right? Hundred percent, grow, grow yeah. together. Yeah, I mean, I, I tell people like I have one child, but during the year it feels like I'm a parent to like seven because these guys are all, you know, I think the oldest guy this year was 25, something like that, 24. Oh, wow. So, um, you know, there's it, it's stressful for them too, and so like I kind of find myself being as much a coach as a, a sounding board, figure, everything, yeah. you know. So, um. I, I tell those guys that look like I, I, I want to win, but at the end of the day, like I, I honestly care about them and I want yeah. to for them and trying to figure out how we can make that happen. The Dean Smith of the uh, 2K league. Uh, is, so a couple of things for our students. Uh, how do you get better every day? How do you continue to progress and, and sort of grow in your career? It seems like you're always challenging yourself. I write every day. Um, I write every single day try to do it seven days a week, maybe five, but I, at least five. I write, I try to write every day. I, John Irving was a About writer. different stuff or yeah. um, John Irving was a writer. I, I always liked, you know, um, uh, world according to Gar, prepare for Owen Meany, a bunch of different stuff, hotel, New Hampshire. Um, and I saw him speak when I was in college somewhere. I saw him speak and he's talked about how, you know, Michael Jordan practices every day. Um, if you're a writer, why shouldn't it be the same thing? So, you know, some days I'll write, an article for Grand City Media. Some days I'll write a, a long email to my dad. Um, you know, whatever it is, I try to make sure I write a couple hundred words at least every single day. Some days I'll write something on my laptop that no one's ever going to see. Yep. Um, but I try to write something every day, 15 minutes, something like that. Um, and when I do it, like, I, I always try to write the best I can. Like I, I don't, I don't skimp on the grammar. I try not to make, you know, the letter U instead of U, whatever. Yeah. Like I, I try to actually write yeah. it. emojis. None of that. No, <laughs> I try to keep it as, as kind of real as I can. So that's, to me, that's something I've been doing now for 20 something years. And I try to keep doing it. It's practice and it keeps that muscle working. Is it also do something for your mind space. Is it? I try to, yeah. Yeah. I also, I do the New York times crossword every day. Oh, wow. Um, which is like, uh, on Sundays it's longer, but you know, Monday, Tuesday, it takes five, 10 minutes, something like that. And it gets yeah. harder as the week goes along, but that kind of tried, I try to do that just to kind of keep my mind engaged Sharp. in, in words and, yeah. and thoughts and thinking differently and that kind of stuff. Um, I don't know. That's probably like the two things I, I, I really try to adhere to. It's interesting. Cause my next question was going to be, what's the most powerful resources you use to grow in your career? And I'm starting to think the New York Times crossword may be one of them, right? <laughs> <Doesn't> hurt. <laughs> yeah. Is, it, are hurt. there other resources that you've used that, may, that you think, man, this is pretty valuable that I use all I, the time? I try to just read a lot. Like, you know, I mean, if that's the, if that's the New York Times, if that's yeah. other magazines, if that's books, um, I, you know, I, I have a Kindle app on my phone and I, I always have some book that I'm in the middle of. Um, and I try and just read all the time because, you know, one of the hardest parts about slam is, or, or doing that kind of writing for a living is, is coming up with new angles and new ways and new, th new, um, ways to posit things, ways to position yeah, things. Yeah. And uh, so I think reading other things gives you ideas, shows you different ways you can do things, kind of helps you think about things differently. And it may not be directly that idea that you're reading, but it may spring something else yeah. in your mind that, that, that you think of. Gab uh, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez is a writer I like a lot, and he, he did, yeah. you know. Love the I'm reading a book of his now. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the books he did, I can't remember which one, he talked about uh, – I, I I just directly stole a line from one of his books about – it was I was writing a story about the Lakers and the Kobe Shaq thing, and I said something about entire schools of thought developed around this idea whatever it was just because i thought it was such yeah, a cool yeah, way yeah. to phrase it but i think like things like that like the more you can like work different things into your writing and stuff it is 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 great you know what's funny is i i'm reading 100 years of solitude now i love that book yeah 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 and so like but what's bizarre and i never really thought of this it, it's not something that i formalized but some of the ideas for the stupid things i say on those top tens come right out of that 
<laughs> you know, come right. Like it'll be, it, it won't be exactly, but it'll be something that springs another thought that you say, I could use that in a way that that's useful for me. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it doesn't have to be a direct line, but as long as it sparks the creativity, it works for me. Like Steve Jobs said, you think differently, right? So and yeah. I think like it, it's a way to, I guess Steve Jobs didn't say that Apple's marketing agency said it, but whatever. But, <laughs> but I, I do think that's valid. Like you have to find ways to think differently about things. I talked to my wife about this recently. Like, we all spend so much time doing stuff, right? We're all working, yeah. we're, we're doing, we're doing, we're everybody's doing it. And like, no one really spends time thinking about how to do things differently. And, and so like, I try to find time to think um, and try to find time. Turning to do, stuff off. Yeah, you know, and part of, part of doing the crossword is that, honestly, for me, um, is just finding a way to kind of like, your brain is focus on that but you know in the back of your head it's why it's like how you always come up with good ideas in the shower right like people yeah. just, that it's the same type of thing i think so I, I try to find ways to sort of allow that to happen yeah you almost need to, to flush your brain of all of the social media and the constant new stuff that comes popping in um i know where you are now i know what you've done do you have any career aspirations at this point? Is there an end goal or are you pretty <laughs> like you've done so many different things. It feels like you're, you're on a wonderful path, but I don't know what, what like would be a dream from here. I don't know. GM of a team, surely. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. Like I, I, I kind of, you know, like you said, it's been an amazing journey and a, a, a wonderful path, but I can't say that I planned this. Yeah. I mean, this league totally agree. Yeah, hundred percent. Like this, all just kind of happened, and we've been able to take advantage of it. And um, you know, I I do think, you know, one thing that's happened in the last six months, um, when all this stuff happened, the first night I posted a picture of my dinner on Twitter, and I used the hashtag quarantine. Yeah, just to kind of be funny and different. And my my boss texted me immediately. And was like, hey, do you think you can make some videos, at, and around cooking? And, uh, yes, the guy who, the guy who does social media for us started reposting my, I kind of challenged myself. I was like, I'm just going to post my dinner every night. Cause we're all stuck at home. Right. So yeah. I'm going to post my dinner every night, right at the start of this thing. And I started trying to make good looking photos and try to like, you know, make it look nice. Yeah. And the, the guy who does our social media, Devin Walker for grants and media would retweet it. And he put hashtag cooking with Lang. So I started trying to figure out a way to make videos and i was like we can't have camera people in our house so my wife films it all on, on my work iphone and i send oh, all the okay. files via slack over to our video team and they edit it all together um and you know i think we've done 25 of them now and, and they've got like over a million views where can people facebook. find this facebook youtube grindcitymedia.com twitter right? we post it everywhere instagram yeah. um it's done over a million views on facebook at this point like wow. it's gone crazy um, so like this whole food thing is still kind of happening. And I had to make a video last night. Like at this point I, I was, I was talking to my boss. I was like, maybe we could have like a hiatus for a couple of weeks or something. <laughs> like I'm kind of running out of stuff that's in my, like, so, you know, so my steaks in the toaster is, isn't going to be the next video. Is it? I don't know. It did pretty well on social media. Uh, yeah, I know you're right. Uh, advice for people looking to get into your position beyond being the, be lucky. Like you and I have been tremendously. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, I just work hard. And the, you know, the other thing I tell people is if you you're a writer like there's a very low barrier to entry right like so yeah anybody can go sign up for a free tumblr and and just start writing twitter is free right yeah. anybody can can go to these places i mean you got to make a name for yourself somehow um and i don't think you can have use the excuse of well i, I don't really have a an outlet or a place to do it yeah. um, all that stuff is free so um take advantage of that you know start make a name for yourself get people to know who you are um, you know, I, I also, I think about all the time, like these football players or people and they find like old tweets of theirs or old things of theirs. And they're like, Oh, I can't believe this guy did this. Like I was already had a job when Twitter started. So I kind of knew not to like go crazy on Twitter or do anything yeah. kind of objectionable. Um, but I, that's the other thing I tell younger people is like, just, just remember, like it's, it's all out there. People are watching Lives so, forever. Yeah. So you want to like start making a name for yourself and start building sort of your brand, for lack of a better term, um, and, and have something that people are going to know you for. Final question. Where do you think the industry will be in 10 years from now? Um, it's a tough question because yeah. it moves so fast. I mean, magazines barely exist anymore, right? Um, yeah. I, I remember when I was at Slam, at one point we were doing a cover shoot somewhere, and 
we took a uh, they they gave me a video camera to go shoot video of the cover shoot as it was happening and i was like you know at some point i think we have to decide if, if this is a magazine company or if this is a content company and now i think slam's done a pretty good job of just being a content company like it's it you know the magazine still comes out but there's all these videos and there's seven or eight different like social media accounts for like high school and kicks and all the other things um and i think that's probably true for all media like i don't know if how long will the New York Times be the New York Times, a newspaper? Like, you yeah. know, at some point, all these things are going to become something that just exists in the cloud, sort of. And in a way, like, this this pandemic has sort of shown that you can exist that way. Like, yeah, you know, like yeah. none of us are going to offices or going to work regularly, and, and all these things are still happening. You and know, some of that may stick long term. Yeah, I, I would think so. I mean, you, you can see that. You know, there's, there's like award shows on TV and stuff. And, and, and I was like, how is this happening? Like no yeah. one's, no one's in, in theaters or going to places. So I think probably long term, I, I, there'll be sort of more of a decentralization of, of these these brands and these places. And, you know, maybe you don't have to, to live in New York City to, to write for New York Magazine. Or maybe you don't have to be in L.A. to write for the L.A. Times. Or, um, you know, yeah. I, you can cover things from afar. I mean, it, I don't know. I don't know. What, I don't know what's opportunity. Next. Yeah. Mean, and I think th the lesson from that, the teachable moment is like just be in a position where you can take advantage of that opportunity, you know, yeah. um, just as soon as you see an opportunity, like I said, like, you know, I, I didn't plan for my career to go this way, but I've been given some chances and I've been able to take advantage of those opportunities. Well, Lang, buddy, uh, I don't want to keep your wife and your kid waiting. I know there's some food that you've got to cook somewhere soon somewhere. Uh, tonight. Uh, so give them my best. It's been a while, but uh, oh. thanks so much for doing this. And uh, when this is all over, I hope to see you soon, okay? Thanks again to Lang Whitaker for stopping by and chatting. The world of NBA gaming and the teams that are springing up from each franchise are an exciting new avenue of entertainment. And they also mean another thing jobs.